The Science Success Center with funding from Title V presents Gas Exchange, a Biology Workshop. Hi, I'm Steve. Diagram 1 illustrates an overview of the three phases of gas exchange. The first phase, which is breathing, is merely the taking in of oxygen and the releasing of carbon dioxide. Oxygen enters and makes its way to the cells lining the lungs and carbon dioxide leaves the blood and enters the lungs where it is then exhaled. Phase 2. The oxygen that has made its way to the lungs is now transported to the rest of the body tissues. The red vessels shown here in the diagram are transporting oxygen-rich blood from the lungs to capillaries in the body tissues, while carbon dioxide is also transported in blood from the tissues back to the lungs. The last phase, oxygen functions in cellular respiration in the mitochondria as the final electron acceptor in the stepwise breakdown of fuel molecules. Water and carbon dioxide are waste products and ATP is produced to power cellular work. The part of an animal where gases are exchanged with the environment is called the respiratory surface. Respiratory surfaces are made up of living cells whose plasma membranes must be wet to function properly. The earthworm is an example of gas exchange through the use of the entire outer skin. Oxygen diffuses into a dense net of thin walled capillaries lying just beneath the skin. Gills are extensions or outfoldings of the body surface specialized for gas exchange. A fish has a set of feather-like gills on each side of its head. Oxygen diffuses across the gill surfaces into capillaries while carbon dioxide diffuses into the opposite direction out of the capillaries and into the external environment. The tracheal system of an insect is an extensive system of branching tubes with the respiratory surface found at their tips. The smallest branches exchange gases directly with the body cells and therefore gas exchange in insects requires no assistance from the circulatory system. Most terrestrial vertebrates have lungs which are internal sacs lined with moist epithelium. As the diagram indicates, the inner surfaces of the lungs branch extensively, forming a large respiratory surface. Gases are carried between the lungs and the body cells by the circulatory system. Diagram 4 shows the human respiratory system. First, air enters our respiratory system through the nostrils. It is filtered by hairs and warmed, humidified, and sampled for odors as it flows through a maze of space in the nasal cavity. From the nasal cavity or mouth, air passes to the pharynx, where the paths for air and food cross. From the pharynx, air is inhaled into the larynx, commonly known as the voice box. From the larynx, inhaled air passes towards the lungs through the trachea or windpipe. Rings of cartilage reinforce the walls of the larynx and trachea, keeping this part of the airway open. The trachea then forks into two bronchi, one leading to each lung. Within the lung, the bronchus branches repeatedly into finer and finer tubes called the bronchioles. The bronchioles dead end in grape-like clusters of air sacs called alveoli. Each of our lungs contains millions of these tiny sacs. The inner surface of each alveolus is lined with a thin layer of epithelial cells. Oxygen and carbon dioxide then diffuse across the epithelial cells. Here, oxygen enters the circulatory system, while carbon dioxide exits the circulatory system. Breathing is the alternate inhalation of air. This ventilation of our lungs maintains high oxygen and low carbon dioxide concentrations at the respiratory surface. Diagram 5 shows the changes that occur in our rib cage, chest cavity, and lungs during breathing. Inhalation. During inhalation, the rib cage expands as muscles between the ribs contract. At the same time, the diaphragm contracts, moving downward and expanding the chest cavity. The volume of the lungs increases with the expanding chest cavity during inhalation, which lowers the air pressure in the alveoli to less than atmospheric pressure. Flowing from a region of higher pressure to one of lower pressure, air rushes through the nostrils and down the breathing tubes to the alveoli. This type of ventilation is called negative pressure breathing. Exhalation, the rib muscles and diaphragm both relax, decreasing the volume of the rib cage and chest cavity, which increases the air pressure inside the lungs, forcing air out. Notice that the diaphragm curves upward into the chest cavity when relaxed.
Although we can voluntarily hold our breath faster and deeper, most of the time our breathing is under automatic control. Breathing control centers are located in the parts of the brain called the pons and medulla oblongata. The control center in the pons smooths out the basic rhythm of breathing set by the medulla. First, nerves from the medulla control center signal the diaphragm and rib muscles to contract, making us inhale. Between inhalations, the muscles relax and we exhale. Secondly, the control center regulates the breathing rate in response to changes in carbon dioxide levels of the blood. When we exercise vigorously, for instance, our metabolism speeds up and our body cells generate more carbon dioxide as a waste product. The carbon dioxide goes into the blood where it reacts with water to form carbonic acid. The acid slightly lowers the pH of the blood and their cerebral spinal fluid. When the medulla senses this pH drop, its breathing control center increases the breathing rate and depth. As a result, more carbon dioxide is eliminated in the exhaled air and the pH returns to normal. And lastly, the secondary control over breathing is exerted by sensors in the aorta and carotid arteries that monitor concentrations of oxygen, as well as carbon dioxide. When the oxygen level in the blood is severely depressed, these sensors signal the control center via nerves to increase the rate of depth of breathing. Diagram 7 illustrates the main components of our circulatory system in the rolling gas exchange. One side of the heart handles oxygen-poor blood, while the other side handles oxygen-rich blood. As indicated in the lower left of the diagram, tissue capillaries send oxygen-poor blood to the heart. The heart then pumps this blood to the alveolar capillaries in the lungs. Gases are exchanged between the air in the alveolar spaces and blood in the capillaries. Blood leaves the alveolar capillaries, having lost carbon dioxide and gained oxygen. This oxygen-rich blood returns to the heart and is pumped out to body tissues. Almost all vertebrates and many invertebrates use hemoglobin to transport oxygen. A hemoglobin molecule consists of four polypeptide chains of two different types. Attached to each polypeptide is a chemical group called a heme, at the center of which is an iron atom. Each iron atom can carry one oxygen molecule. Thus, every hemoglobin molecule can carry up to four oxygen molecules. Hemoglobin loads up with oxygen in the lungs and transports it to the body tissues. There, hemoglobin unloads some or all of its cargo depending on the oxygen needs of the cells. Thank you everyone for watching. Come visit us at the SSC if you have any questions. Good luck in all your studies and tune in for the next workshop.